What is up, everybody? Welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups Station, and welcome to a very special presentation of Rockin' Robbie Live. Tonight, of course, I am joined by Brian Eak. What's up, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Station. Hey, Station. All right. And the uh, the room has turned more into the puke color again. That's right. It's, it's nice. Time. When we had Ram on last week, it was during the day, and it looked like you were in a normal room. But now, of yeah. course, you're in the... yeah. Yeah, but we happens. appreciate it because you you adorn it with amazing artwork. I do. I do. Right? And artwork by our guest. I was, I mean, I was, that was my segue. Thanks for snatching it away from, from, from me. But uh, ladies but, and gentlemen, let me introduce to you our guest tonight. He is the Eisner nominated writer and artist of books like Jaeger, High Crimes, Savage Things, the upcoming book, the uh, not The Count, but Count, available from humanoids on march 16th and it's really good it's like this sci-fi reimagining of the count of monte cristo we'll get into that but ladies and gentlemen he also has work at marvel and dc by the way um please give a mighty warm and hearty station to ibrahim mustafa station 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 <laughs> did i do it right <laughs> yeah station I so. yeah. awesome i love it yeah thank you guys for having me Thank you for being here. Uh, he's also, full disclosure, he's also Brian's cousin. But don't worry, he's let us know that like 80 times on these shows. So, just so we're saying, right? It might not be that high, but I haven't been <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just yeah, kidding. Brian is one of very few cousins that I have. And we didn't actually even meet until like 2012. Right. At, at my grandfather and his uncle's funeral. So that was like the one little bit of silver lining was like a bunch of family got together for the first time ever in my life. And he was there. And so we got to meet in person and I had never met his dad before and he looked just like my grandpa. So it was this very cool, like, you know, and he was super funny and yeah. So it was, a, uh, you know, it was a, a little bit of a shiny thing inside of a dirt pile. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and, uh, and about count. Yeah. Um, so I'm from, uh, the Pacific Northwest, Portland, Oregon. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm self-taught artist and writer. And, um, I, uh, I like action figures a lot. I, I make custom action figures when I'm not drawing comics, which is not very often. So I try to, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. And then count is, uh, my first like full length graphic novel that I have both written and drawn. Um, and, uh, yeah, I love, I love revenge stories. Like I love John wick and stuff like taken and, you know, uh, stories of justice and comeuppance and stuff like that. And I got to thinking one day, like, what is the, what is like the, the, one of the greatest revenge stories of all time has to be the count of Monte Cristo. Absolutely. And then, so yeah, from there I thought like, well, what if it was cool? Because like not not to no disrespect, like it is very cool, but the original novel by Alexander Dumas is like 1100 pages something like that, and it's very dry. Like it's a, it's there's no action in it. A lot of people go, "Oh, it's a swashbuckling tale." It's like, "Nah, it's not." Like <laughs> Three Musketeers by Dumas was swashbuckling. So I think people kind of uh, you know, confuse those two, but yeah, the the book itself is like it's like a soap opera, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, there was the 2002 movie with Jim Caviezel and Guy Pierce, which was great. I love and, that movie. Yeah. It's fantastic. It really distills the story down very well, um, and injects some, some more excitement into it. But the, the original is, you know, he's putting, he's, he plays different characters, you know, and goes undercover essentially into these people's lives to uncover drama and dirt about them and, and expose them and, you know, eventually ruin their lives. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to do something that I, I was like, what if this had more action and took place like in a sci-fi ish fantasy kind of element where, um, you know, it's more updated because, you know, Napoleonic France was of a time. Right. So uh, that was kind of how I got started on it. And then I just chipped away at uh, a, a pretty solid pitch package for it while I was working on other work for hire stuff like James Bond. and then. Um, yeah, I uh, got the opportunity to pitch it to humanoids and, you know, hilarity ensued and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> how, 
It comes out March 16th, everybody. And yep. I read it last night. Brian's already read it. And we love it. We, I think it's amazing. It's so oh, much fun. You, man. It does distill that story. It's got that, you know, sci-fi edge to it, but it doesn't take away from the core of the characters of the story. And that's what I loved. And your rendering, yo, and I feel bad because we always invite these creators on the show. And I feel like I'm just like, you know, fluffing them up this entire time. But like, <laughs> I don't know anybody who does action and pacing and rhythm as well as you are doing, especially in count. Oh, it thank really you, blew me away. Thank really you. blew me away. So let's talk about this. You got a three book deal with humanoids, right? Yes. So you got two more coming. Yeah. And they're not going to be sequels to count, which, you know, sometimes like the wording can make it seem like when they did the press release, it made it seem like it was going to be books one, two, and three. They're, they're different stuff. Um, the, the next one is, uh, just over halfway done now. So I'm already, you know, I'm cooking. Um, and, uh, you know, a totally different genre, but, um, nice. yeah, it was, a, it was very cool. So, you know, they, when I got in the door at humanoids, they had hired Mark Wade as like an editorial consultant, I believe. And that guy, you know, he's on my Mount Rushmore of comics, like, uh, Superman is my favorite character. He's written some of the best Superman stories ever told. You know, he was one of the first writers that I ever became aware of when I got into comics, um, in, into reading them. And so, uh, when I found out that he was the one who said like, you guys got to sign this book, like, so, you know, uh, to a deal, uh, I, that was pretty cool. And then, um, he was eventually hired on to be full-time publisher. And, uh, so presenting the, um, contract was his idea, which was again, very, very cool. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm locked in for two more and I'm excited about it, man. So, so when you, uh, pitched it, were you pitching it just as, as the one book and then it, it became a three book deal or was that just, yeah. Um, I basically how it played out is we were rounding third base on count and my editor was like, Hey, uh, you know, we want to do more stuff with you. So, um, you know, do you have other ideas that you kind of want to work on? And I was like, yeah, you know, and, and so he said, all right, well, why don't we, you know, put a list together of stuff you want to do and we'll let you know what kind of fill, uh, holes in our, in our publishing uh, line we're trying to fill in terms of genre and stuff like that. If that helps you narrow down maybe what you want to do. And so we, we batted that stuff back and forth for a bit. Um, and then uh, once I had told them like, okay, here, here's like three ideas here's the one I want to do the most. Um, then they were like, you know, they, they reviewed it and said, okay, this one looks great. Let's do it. And by the way, like we'd like to make this, you know, part of a, an overall deal. So count is the first book. And then, you know, your next two will be, uh, you know, from this list or whatever you want to do. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a nice kind of organic thing to it. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I was going to also ask, is Count, like, is it the only comic that so far has been promoted using a uh, writer, the writer and artist uh, doing a robot dance to Zap and Roger? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, are there other people in comics that break dance or, you know, I'm sure there's some dudes who are like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I used to do that. And then they'll go like, you know, but I was, <laughs> yeah. I was, that was my thing before, before I got into comics. I mean, I started. I've been doing it for like 20 years now. I realized I started in high school. Um, I met, so there was a, a boys and girls club program at my old middle school and uh, it was called night court and you could just go, you know, shoot around, play basketball. You could win trailblazers tickets. Um, and I wasn't good at basketball, but you know, it was something to do. I was a poor kid and it was free. And, uh, so I went one night beginning of my sophomore year of high school and there was, uh, this guy who was one of the, you know, volunteer counselor type of people there who was like my age that I am now, he's in his mid thirties. And he was showing some other kids, some dance moves in the corner and he was doing locking. Now people conflate popping and locking as pop locking, but they're two different things. Popping is like, it's kind of like hit, right? And, and locking is like this kind of, you know, rerun used to do it on uh, what's happening. Right. Yeah. Um, and so Willie was locking and Willie was his name. And I, and I was just like, man, I thought it was disco dancing. Cause you know, there's pointing involved. And I thought he was doing the, you know, 
<laughs> and I knew how to do an arm wave, right? Because I had learned from like this older kid who used to live in my apartments and I could moonwalk because I, I, you know, saw another kid do it. And so I, I, I dabbled in dancing, but I didn't know much beyond that. So, so I was like, oh, let me, I like dancing. Let me humor this old guy, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then he did this like more of a, what's called a ticking arm wave. Right. And it blew my mind. Like, and I was just like, Oh my God, That's teach awesome. me. So I would go back every Friday night and learn from Willie. And eventually he became like my real life, Mr. Miyagi. Like we're, you know, to this day, like I just talked to him the other day, like we're still, you know, I call him on father's day and he's oh, like, a, he's cool. like a dad to me. So yeah, it was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, thing to stumble into in my youth you know it's super cool does did he make you like wax his car and paint fences and stuff too so kinda i mean it was <laughs> it was never it was never like a like a like a lesson in dance right it was just like hey you're free labor <laughs> you know yeah. he's <laughs> willie willie is from harlem he grew up in new york in you know in, in the 70s and 80s and um he just has that like like his motto in life is like never pay full price for anything like he's just one of those like bartering bargaining new yorker type of guys and uh and so he was all too eager to put me to work anytime you know <laughs> but i mean i was getting stuff out of it like he he his that guy taught me so much about life and being an adult and being a decent man and stuff like that so you know, it was well worth it. But here, here's an example of the type of shit Willie would do. One time, uh, I when I first moved out, um, I needed to buy a microwave. And he and his wife had just remodeled their kitchen. And they had a microwave that they bought while, you know, to use while their official one was being installed or whatever. And they had it for months. And, and uh, his wife said, oh, we have a microwave you can have. And he was like, you can buy it. She was like, he, she's like, we're not going to sell it to him. He, you, we used it. And he's like, no, I'm going to take it back to the store. And she was like, Willie, we've had that microwave for like six months. You're, and he's like, oh, I can take it back. Don't you worry about it. And she was like, you're not going to take it back. So then she was like, you can just have it. Don't listen to him. So they gave me the microwave. And then like months later, I was working in a, in an auto uh, dealership in the parts department. Right. And he needed a part for his car that came out to be about the same price as that microwave. I had forgotten all about that. So I, <laughs> and so he hits me up like, Hey, can you get this part for me with your discount? And then I'll just pay you for it later. And I was like, yeah, yeah, totally. And so I, so I go over to his house and I give him the part and he's like, so we're cool for the microwave then. Right. And I was like, oh, mother <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Shout out to Willie. Uh, yeah. yeah shout guy. out yeah. to Willie. That's yeah, awesome. Shout out to Willie for sure. You ever thought about doing a, like a book straight up about like dancing and break dancing. I bet you could render that really excellently. You know, I've, it, it would be really, it'd be difficult to do in a way that like, I don't know how you, I mean, it's kind of like if you did a, a, a book about like magic or something, right? Like how do you show an illusion on in static images? So I, that, that would definitely be like a, a challenge. One thing I have thought about doing, I don't really get into slice of life comics that much, but, Willie has a pretty fascinating story. And I remember when we were, he, he doesn't live uh, in Oregon anymore. Um, but when he was up here and I was, you know, my late teens, um, he had a guy like a, a, a writer who was coming over a lot and interviewing him because they were going to do a book on Willie's life. Um, oh. Cause he has a pretty fascinating life. And so I, I have, and that fell out, fell through for whatever reason, but I have thought like, you know, it'd be cool maybe if I one day did like a, a book on Willie's life, like that could be kind of tight. So that would be cool. And then you could have some of those sequences in there, you know? Yeah, so, for sure. And I would you. know, I feel like I would know the right things to highlight because I've lived that dance scene life. And I know like which parts to build up and it would be authentic and not like some Hollywood shit where they're just like, you know, it's crazy because yeah. when when movies like You Got Served and Step Up came out, like they they were caricatures of what the dance scene is really like. But then they were so popular that they informed what the dance scene then became. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, so it's it had an effect on well. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. So how why how did you get into comics? Uh, you know, so when I was a little kid, I was super into Superman. Like that was. 
I mean, my earliest memories are watching the Christopher Reeve movies. Yes. And I, I got to tell you, uh, I'm a big, big proponent of Superman Four: the quest for peace. I think it's the best Superman movie uh, that Reeve did. And I will, really? I will die on that hill. Really? <laughs> we don't have to get into that, but. Um, oh, we're going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So real quick, that movie does things that no other Superman movie does, right? It starts off and he is rescuing cosmonauts in space, right? Now this movie came out in 1988. So yeah. the cold war was kind of, you know, petering out, but it was still a thing. And immediately right off the bat, Superman is speaking Russian to them. And it just shows you like in the, fr- in the opening scene that Superman is for the world, right? He's not just for America, which I thought was dope. Um, not, I mean, not when I was four, but now, you know, <laughs> I can look at it and go, yeah, that's cool. Um, and then, and then he's, he's, uh, yeah, this fable says I like four too, Ibrahim. That's what I'm talking about, man. Um, then, you know, we see him on the farm and he is in a position to have to sell it. His mom has passed on, you know, we saw his father pass away in the first movie and he's telling the realtor, like, I don't want to sell it to someone who's to build a shopping mall. Like they want to have to want a real farm, you know? Um, and then he takes like the last Kryptonian crystal and like does some made up powers shit and his ship disappears. (laughs) But, um, you know, then the daily planet is bought by like a national inquirer inquirer type of, you know, uh, tabloid. Right. So he's dealing with the last bits of his home, you know, Krypton, the last bits of the farm home. And then the work that he is known is changing, right? So there's like all this change happening and in the midst of it, he's, he's being challenged to intercede into human affairs and stop the arms race, you know, like, um, and on top of that, you got Lacey Warfield, the daughter of the guy who bought the daily planet and she likes Clark Kent, but Clark Kent likes Lois Lane and Lois Lane likes Superman. So there's this fun love triangle and it's cool to see someone like Clark for who he is, you know? Um, or at least who he pretends to be in the fumbling Clark Kent way. But um, yeah, man, there's a dope fight scene on the moon. I mean, come on. Like, okay. It, yeah. You, you, villain, you've, you've encouraged me to revisit it. It's, it's worth yeah. a revisit. The villain is corny, obviously, you know, but also I think we get the best, best Lex Luthor out of that one. He's like in a penthouse. Like Lex Luthor should be. He's not living in a fucking sewer somewhere. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> I've always been bothered by the Lex. In yeah, the first the first movie. Yeah, man, um, but I don't like the. I mean, Gene Hackman obviously, you know, one of the greatest of all time. But like the the way they play the, bum, 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 you know, oh, geez, Mr. Luthor, like it's corny, you know. Yeah. And I think yeah. he was the most like scary and villainous in the in the fourth one. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, I think people remember that one poorly because I don't know if you guys saw that Canon Films documentary, but. You know, they were this wild company that just bought up a bunch of properties. And and so, you know, they they cut the budget on that movie and they reused effects a lot. So there's like one scene of Superman flying toward the camera that you just see 10 times throughout. Over the film, and over. You know? yeah. yeah. So Canon I mean, did uh, a lot of those kind of cheap movies back in the day. They did some good stuff, but like yeah. didn't like three had a budget cut, too, didn't it? Like. And I, I heard think, somewhere that three was supposed to be Brainiac and then they changed it because I, for some reason. And I think that, so. Well, they yeah. tried to make it a comedy, you know, they had Richard Pryor in there and uh, Richard Pryor is the best part of Superman three. Oh, that and the hands down scared the yes. hell out of me when I was a kid. Yes. Oh, with the robot God. girl. Jesus. The <laughs> sister. Yeah. Um, I also, I think the cool thing about four is that you kind of have this, this really wonderful moment between Lois and Superman and, well, I guess he's Clark in that scene, but like, you know, he he fights the villain and he gets sick from it. The guy, he scratches him with these like silver press on nails and he gets sick and he turns into an old man, which is weird. Uh, and, <laughs> and he has to use like the last Kryptonian crystal to like nurse him back to health. Right. And uh, Lois comes to see him and she, you know, she has Superman's cape because it was it came off during the battle and was like landed on the Statue of Liberty Island or whatever. And so someone sends it to the Daily Planet and Lois takes it to Superman and and she basically tells Clark, like, you know, without saying, I know you're Superman. She's just like, look, if you see him or if you hear from him, tell him that 
we miss him and we need him, you know, and she gives him the cape back and it kind of gives him the like reinforcement he needs to go out there and be super. And he addresses the U- the United Nations in a scene that gives me chills every time I watch it. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm going to go back heard- and watch this. It's been 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've seen it since it came out. It's, well, it's better than you remember. I promise. Just wait. Better, I like it better than two personally. I, wow. Okay, maybe the know, strong cut, word. maybe not the Donner <laughs> cut. They both, they, one and two, as much as I love them, they have the worst superhero movie endings ever. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. Um, but I do have, there are rumors that they're doing a uh, Snyder cut of Superman Quest for Peace. So I'm really excited for that one. Like Seriously? No, that's just, oh, I was like, just a bit, well, man. I'm sorry. It's just a joke. Well, no, <laughs> I don't leave my heart like that, Robbie. Damn. <laughs> well, there, there, is, <laughs> there was like a bizarro scene that was cut from that movie, and it's really bad, and I'm glad they cut it. But See, I heard that I heard that they wanted Bizarro in 4 and Brainiac in 3, but then they kept cutting the budget because they were like, it's a Superman movie. People are going to come see it. Right. No, no yeah. they didn't. <laughs> so, oh, but anyway. Really interesting. Your you question was, how did I get into comics? <laughs> uh, who that cares was, about that? You got us yeah. all excited for Quest, of Pe- for Quest for Peace for the first time ever. I'm telling you, man. It, there's there's some real good good moments to it. Um, you know, there's made up powers and shit. Like, you know, they give him this like blue version of Heat Vision where he rebuilds the Great Wall of China just by looking at it. That's something hmm. straight from like the 1950s, though. You know, Superman would have right. done that yeah. in the 50s. Yeah, well, and here's yeah, the thing. If he needed a power, he got it. Yeah, and everyone's like, oh, it's so stupid. I'm like, oh, but you swear by Superman 2 where he pulls a fucking fruit roll up off his chest and throws it at somebody. <laughs> so, you know. I love that. <laughs> fair point. But, fair uh, point. Yeah. Anyway, so Superman, that was my thing. My first <laughs> my first two comics were um uh John Burns Man of Steel number two. Ooh. And it came with a ca- audio cassette that had like voice actors and sound effects. And that's kind of how I learned to read was from that pairing. And then I also got, I think it was detective 683 or 623. I don't remember exactly what number it was, but it was a, a um, I think it was Marv Wolfman and, and uh, Jim Aparo with Dick Giordano. I want to say on inks. Um, so I was always more into the kind of realistic renderings of the characters, you know, or I guess those were comic-y, but on the, in that Neil Adams school, you know? Um, and then, uh, you know, I fell out of them for a long time. I mean, I was, I was huge in the Ninja Turtles. Like I, I love the turtles. Um, Eric Durant says, uh, ashamed to say I've never seen Superman three or four. What have I done with my life? Well, you've lived it, man. That's all right. But now you can go back and uh, check them out. I like how you <laughs> were addressing the comments. I love that. Yeah, my <laughs> bad. That's probably your job. No, I just no. saw pop up and yeah. No, go for it. I usually just let them sit up there and then, you know, ignore them. Oh, get so. to them. <laughs> no, go for um, it. That's awesome. But uh, yeah, so like, I mean, I was born in '85, so I was prime age for the Ninja Turtles movie and cartoon oh. and stuff. Um, and uh, so, and then the X Men cartoon was was a real big deal in my childhood. Um, and then I got into the uh, the X Men. Do you remember those Fleer Ultra trading cards from like ninety four, ninety five? The whole set, man. Yeah, dude. Yeah, <laughs> I got them in a binder in my office here somewhere. <laughs> nice. Um, but in those like card sleeves, you know, that you get for baseball cards and stuff. Oh man, mm-hmm. I was. I found a garage sale once as a kid where I got them for ten cents a piece, and I was just you know because some kid was over them and I wasn't, so I was like, sweet. Um, nice. So then, you know, I used to try to draw the the images that were on that and stuff, and I would I draw Ninja Turtles and Superman and Wolverine all the time, and Cyclops, and and then uh, as I got older, I just kind of fell out of it. I got really into you know more into video games. I, I was obsessed with Mortal Kombat when I was a kid, um, and then uh, you know got into soccer because my dad's an immigrant, and then I got into <laughs> got into uh, dancing in high school, and then Smallville hit the airwaves right around the time, like the Spider-Man movies were coming out and stuff. And yeah. so there was this bit of a resurgence of my interest in that stuff. And, uh, when, uh, Smallville got going, I, I like totally reignited my love of Superman. And then somebody got me a gift. It was like the complete history of Superman hardcover book. Right. And it had, um, like old Siegel and Schuster era, images of superman on the 
dust jacket, but when you pulled them off, those images were recreated by Alex Ross. And because I was always into the more realistic depiction of this stuff, when I saw his Superman paintings, like it was like seeing that arm wave from Willie again. It just blew my mind, right? And I was just yeah. like, I, you can do that? Like I didn't I've never seen, you know, aside from actors playing them, I've never seen these characters drawn like this. So I I was obsessed with, all right, now I gotta figure out who this artist is, what they're using. I got and I gotta learn how to do it. And so for a while, I was like, I'm going to be the next Alex Ross. Like, I was, I'm just going to paint covers. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I discovered Kingdom Come and, you know, Mark Wade, And Mark um, and then I just was buying up every Superman book that I could find that had cool art in it. Um, and, you know, it was down the rabbit hole from there. And then I was and then I discovered different writers and artists and, and um, different kinds of comics, you know, yeah. and. And uh, yeah, and then so. it all expanded, right? Yep. the The first Superman I ever read was the John Byrne stuff, and it just I have always just been so into the character because of it. You know, he yeah. just represents something so true and honest inside of us. And you know, and so many people tell me at the shop every day that they don't like Superman because he's a Boy Scout, and and you know, I've lived you know a long time, I guess. You know, like as like both of us. Brian's a little bit older than us, but we're not going to call him out on it. <laughs> but uh. You know, and, and I feel like, you know, you don't like Superman because he makes you feel bad because you're not doing what Superman <laughs> would do, you know, but uh, man, that, like, that's a is, really good. I've never thought about it like that, but I think you're right. I, I really think it is like yeah. I, there's a piece of you that you know, like we like Batman because he makes mistakes. He's dark. He's broody. He's depressed. And he's right. You know, we're like, oh, I relate to Batman. Well, we should be relating to Superman because Superman's more of the ideal to me. Like he's. He's kind of like a mythological figure that we should like really dwell on. I don't know. Yeah. No, right. he's doing point. the right thing for the right reasons, right? You know, and Batman's doing it. You know, some of it's the right reasons, but I mean, it's a revenge kind of, you know, you know right. kind yeah. of much and darker. We're not, and we're not shitting on Batman, y'all. You know, we, no. we, we love Batman. Right. You know? well, but. Yeah. I was going to say, growing up with, you know, you know, I grew up in the 70s, kind of a dark time, early 80s, pretty dark time. And uh, <clears throat> Superman wasn't, you know, like high on everybody's list at that time. And I think that's because of the darkness and people were, you know, you know, anti, you know, these pure ideals and things like that. Cause I, I do remember reading dark Knight returns and, and uh, you know, when, you know, Batman fights Superman, I was just like, Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and everything like that. Yeah. And then, uh, um, but I did, I love John Burns, man of steel, you know, when that came out and I thought that was really cool, but, uh, but, you know, I got to credit you, Ibrahim for, for, you know, my love of Superman now, because like, you know, I mean, when we started hanging out again, you know, you were talking about that and I was like, you know, I just haven't really read much, <laughs> you know, and, and, yeah. uh, uh, cause you turned me on to that one. Uh, is it, uh, uh, secret, secret identity? identity? Yep. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, that is, I mean, it's, it's the that's a glorious music book. one. Yeah. Oh, that's an amazing book. It's fantastic. Yeah. That was one of the first, because I was going by the art. Like I didn't really, I didn't know anything about writers. I didn't care. I just was like, what is, what are the best drawings of Superman? And so I was, I remember I was in a Borders, Borders or Barnes and Noble, one of the two. And I was just going through their whole DC section, and I found that book, and I was just like, this is it. Like this is some of the best Superman to this day. It's one of the best drawn Superman books ever made. And uh, you know, then I read it, and I was like this is incredible. And I've, yeah. I've got like four different versions of that book. It's so stupid. Like when I find it, I just buy it so I can give it to people and you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, I'm glad you love that one, man. And uh, yeah, you actually have what is the best Superman I've ever drawn on your wall right there. So I'm, that's true. I'm Pull it down, Ryan, show family. it to us. Pull it down. Okay. <laughs> okay. Making him, making well, him work. You mentioned it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, look at that. I had so much fun doing that, man. That was like easily yeah. easily the most fun commission I've ever done. So thank you again for that. Oh, thank you. I love it's it. so awesome. Sorry, you have to rehang it now. <laughs> <laughs> he could just leave it, but he's got to. He's got to put it back up, you know. Um is, is that like a, is that a uh is that a dream project of yours, Ibrahim, to do Superman? To do like a uh, yeah, you know, I think about that a lot because it's funny. 
when I when I was getting into comics, like, oh, thank you, Stefan. Um, Fable says, I love Supes as a kid, got into Batman later. Yeah, I for me, it was around the same time, but Superman was always the one I liked the most, you know? Um, yeah, you know, I, it's funny. Like, w- when I was first getting into comics, like, Superman's all I wanted to draw, right? And And I still want to, but it's like, it has... You know, you get a little disillusioned with the industry and and you kind of, you know, you start to see like, okay, well, what if I get the chance, but I have to draw like new 52 Superman or like what, you know (laughs) what I mean? Or like, uh, what if, I mean, a lot of the times I've gotten to do big two stuff, it's like the hero, but it's not that version. Like, like I got to work on Dr. Fate and it was like not Kent Nelson, Dr. Fate. It was like the new Dr. Fate, which was cool. And I did actually get to draw a classic Dr. Fate in there, but like, you know, the first issue I drew is like, he's in a hoodie and I'm like, I don't want to draw a guy in a hoodie, you know, or like, um, uh, I drew an issue of the flash. Uh, yep. I drew an issue of the flash, uh, CW tie in digital book. Right. Which was super fun, but it was like about Caitlin snow and, uh, uh, what's, what's the funny kid's name? Who's Vibe? Uh, oh, he became Vibe. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. I don't remember the character's name. It's been so long. It's been so long. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it was like the two of them go on a little adventure, and I drew the Flash on like three pages out of like twenty-two, <laughs> you know, twenty-four. So it's like it's always like the hero, but it's their day off, and they're like in a you know at a coffee shop kind of thing. So um, if if I were to get to do Superman, I would hope that it would be ideally something that I write and draw, or maybe if I got to collaborate with Mark Wade on it, that would be incredible. Cause you know, we've, he knows how much I love Superman and we've, we've had some brief chats about our mutual love of the character. So, you know, we've, we've kind of said, we've kind of said, wouldn't that be cool one day? So we'll see what happens there. But yeah, you know, it's funny though, because as your taste changes and as you get into, um, other kinds of stuff and just see the industry, you know, on the, behind the curtain a little more, like, I I really love doing my own stuff and you know, you get more creative control and I think the likelihood of getting to write and draw my own Superman thing in a way that I would like to um, is less just because like they usually want to hire like a big name writer and an artist kind of thing. Right. And yeah, and I say this a lot, so it's getting a little bit of, to be a bit of a tired analogy, but like writing, working from someone else's script is like having someone pick out your own clothes for you. Like they go into your closet and they're like, wear this and this. And you're like, I, I don't even really know why I have that shirt anymore. I don't like it. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and so you feel like uncomfortable and like your shit doesn't match. And you're like, this isn't what I would do. This is, I'm not putting my best foot forward, you know? But when you get to write it, you it feels like you're getting dressed for a first date or like a job interview or something. Like you're you're like I'm I know where my strengths lie and I am, you know, playing to those strengths. So I can do action stuff the way I like it because I choreographed it, right? And and I created the scenario by which those characters were in an action setting. So I'm not sitting there going, well, how do I make these characters do this? Because the writer said xyz happens and that shit doesn't make any sense you know what i mean so yeah that's kind (laughs) of weird long roundabout answer of yeah superman would be cool (laughs) yeah yeah well i was gonna i I do want to take it back to the drawing the action because like i mean the way you draw action is just it's oh it's just always amazing and one thing i noticed in uh uh count and uh i did reread uh uh this last night by the way oh right on thank you um and uh, we're going to talk about this later again, too, by the way. But um, uh, the, one of the techniques I really like that you use is like the, where the action's in a confined space and you kind of you have the whole panel like contain like the scene. And then you have the little inset panels uh, like, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess. Is that something you use frequently or like how is like, I don't know, it's, it's just an amazing way to show the action. Thank you, man. I, that was something that I came up with. Uh, when I was first getting into drawing comics and again, it was something that I wrote and drew, you know, when I was like going to make my, my survival horror epic when I was first, getting, I was like, I'm going to write and draw colors. And, 
Um, I did, and actually, it's funny. I Ed Brisson lettered it for me because he used to be a freelance oh, really? letterer. Yeah, so that's uh, I've known Ed as long as I've known anyone in comics because of that. Um, oh, cool. And uh, yeah, so for me, it was like it just made sense in a way of you know you have limited real estate with the number of pages you have and the space on the page. So how can you fit as much as possible into one area? So you kind of have your base image and then you highlight different moments within that image. And I, the thing I like about it is that you're not breaking it up panel to panel. So there's less of an Odin's uh, onus on the reader to have to fill in the gaps mentally, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the way that a, a white gutter has uh, the effect of. So um, I guess it's it's the most fluid way I have found to show things happening without like breaking them up into different beats too much. Um, so yeah, I, I, I enjoy that using that when it's, you know, the right place for it, for sure. Yeah, because it, like it's striking too, because the different colors, you know, kind of help you with the timing aspect of it, right? You know, in the way it's like, I mean, it'll be like, you know, slightly different, you know. Yeah. And that's, that's all like in the case of count, that's all Brad Simpson. Like he, he saw it and just knew what to do with it. And, and Jordan Boyd on solstice as well. Um, you know, especially giving it that kind of red tint that they do. Mm -hmm. It's like, it shows you like, this is a danger moment, you know, where, where everything's heightened. Um, and that's, that's one of the cooler little serendipitous moments, I think in, in like, collaboration between like art line art and colorists you know mm -hmm. yeah uh so yeah well since you brought up brad uh like um you know when you mentioned you were uh that he was coming on to do the colors for the book i went i didn't realize that i was already reading books that he was coloring uh like yeah. uh uh crone and and uh um uh what was that that kind of grindhouse one that dan waters wrote or coffin oh um, coffin bound yeah yeah, uh, there's phenomenal work there. Uh, so, um, yeah, what? Uh, yeah, what's it like working with Brad and everything? He's uh, he's great, man. Like we, we, you know, we become buddies, and like, I guess he has. So I met Brad through Justin Greenwood, who drew Crone that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I was having dinner with Justin and Dennis Culver, who who wrote Crone uh, at Emerald City back in the last one we had was it 2019 and uh they were showing me pages from that and i was like who colored that and they're like oh that's our, our buddy brad like he's so good blah, blah blah and so that was i think when i first became aware of him and his work um and then you know initially jordan was going to color count just because you know jordan was oh. the guy i was working with and he was my you know good friend and stuff and then he ended up making kind of a career pivot like he he got a cool opportunity to do some I remember what he's doing now. It's something with like video production, film stuff, which is what he went to school for. Um, and, you know, comics are a grind and he's got a young kid and, you know, he, he just got married and stuff. So he was like, hey, man, like I, I got to I got to make this change. And I was like, dude, by all means, man, like, you know, live your best life. Right. <laughs> so then and he hadn't gotten started on it anyway. So um, it was still like, you know, fresh, fresh snow to walk through. So. I was like, okay, well, we got to find someone to color this book. And um, Justin suggested Brad. And I was like, oh, right. Like, I loved those Chrome pages he did. And so, uh, you know, reached out to him and he was available. And it, we were just off to the races. And I guess he has a, a background as like a, a landscape painter, which really shows because, I mean, the skies that that guy does are just mm -hmm. insane like he he brings that book to a whole other visual level because i think brian when you first read it, it i sent you the black and white pdf right so you hadn't seen yeah. it in color yeah yeah and i did like grayscale ink washes in the book so there was like separation of elements visually in that respect but like not i mean you know it was black and white so then when you see color on them that brad did it's just like whoa yeah yeah, I mean, it was it was cool reading it, you know, in black and white. So, but yeah, it was, and you were teasing pages, you know, on on Twitter and everything like that. Yeah. I was just like, I don't know, every every one, I was just getting more and more excited. So, yeah, the color looks amazing and count, uh, fantastic stuff. Um, what are your favorite current comics, Ibrahim? Do oh man, read, or do you have no time to read? 
<laughs> well, so typically I don't have any time, but I've been making time because like I just missed it, you know, and I I don't remember what got me to dip back in, but I was, you know, I read stuff digitally as it comes out uh, here and there. Um, but yeah, man, it's just, it's, it takes so freaking long to draw these things that like, I just don't get the chance to sit down with them like I used to, Yeah. but, oh, you know what it was? I got a Comixology Unlimited subscription. So that allows me to just kind of dip into stuff, especially during the pandemic, you know, when I'm not yeah. getting to the store as much as I would like to, um, at all, frankly, <laughs> I mean, I, I have, there's a local shop, our buddy, Doug, who, uh, Brian has met Doug O'Loughlin, Comic Cave PDX. Um, I'll, I'll do mail order stuff from him every now and then. And, um, you know, and I like, Oh, actually, so it was twofold. I was, when the pandemic hit, I bought a bunch of stuff from a bunch of different comic shops online. Cause I was just like, you know, I wanted to support and, um, you know, like the, I've met a lot of these folks at conventions, you know, like, and, and, uh, and so I just, I just hit up, um, uh, Yes, that is Eric. That is a Mask of Zorro painting I've been working on for months. When I say working on, I started it months ago, and it's been sitting there because I haven't had time to work on it. But thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, that that movie is a big influence on Count. I love that movie, and I just like the 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 pacing of it and the kind of um, you know the action in it. Like it was, it, I it was very much on my mind while I was making the book. Um, yeah, so I, I bought a bunch of stuff from retailers, and uh, that got me. And I was like, okay, well, I have it. I'm going to read it. And then I'll read these, and I'll buy more because I want to support the shops. And so that's that's what got me back in the groove of it. And then I got the unlimited subscription. So between those two things, I've actually been reading more stuff. So I'm not super current on anything, but like recently I read um, Hawkeye Freefall by Matt Rosenberg and oh, Otto Schmidt. Yeah. And man, I I don't think I've ever laughed that much, if at all, yeah. reading a comic. Like it was fucking hilarious. And Matt's a funny guy anyway. Like, um, but yeah, so that was a lot of fun. Um, I've been reading some European stuff too. That's primarily what I what I use the Comicsology Unlimited thing for is stuff that you can't really get from a local shop as mm -hmm. easily. Um, so I, I I tore through like four volumes of this book called The Undertaker. Um, and I'm, I'm blanking on the, uh, the writer and artist, uh, so apologies to them, but it's a, uh, it's a Western, it's a French comic, but it's like a Western that takes place in the U S and it's about this undertaker who has his wagon and he just goes from town to town and, uh, you know, collects their dead and a fee and, you know, and he gets brought embroiled in different, uh, hijinks, like in, in the first book, this very rich guy. Uh, who owned gold mines ate his gold. Like he forced it down his own, th basically, you know, so that no one else could have it. And then the undertaker was supposed to take him and bury him in his own mine because he was just being a shit and didn't want anyone else to have it. <laughs> and so all the miners who are like, you know, dying in the mines and like starving and stuff are like, that's, that's our gold. He should have been leaving us to us, leaving it to us. So basically, they're after this undertaker and the, the, you know, um, uh, whoever he left the, the evil mind guy left in charge of his estate, like with the instructions to bury him, like, you know, so they're, they're running from these gold miners who are trying to tear them apart and get this gold out of this guy's <laughs> cadaver and shit. It's great. It's really good. Um, that sounds really cool. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like my kind of jam. <laughs> yeah. Those, I like, think you uh, dig it. Old stuff or no, they're they're from the last few years. Like I think I think oh, okay. the first one I think the most recent volume was volume four, and I think they're working on five now. So okay. within the last like decade, I want to say. Okay. Yeah. And beautiful art too. Richard no. It's not Richard. Something I don't I don't remember the guy's name, but man. Um uh just just incredible art. It's like I don't know how to describe it. It's it's like a very lush kind of brushwork. Like it's European, but it's like Western enough that it's like it's not esoteric or or you know hard to get into. Like it's a very like meat and potatoes, just beautifully drawn, you know, comic. Almost like almost like a Wally Wood type of influence or something. Yeah, Robbie's got it up here. 
well, gorgeous stuff. There's a uh, that the covers are, I believe, paintings by the interior artists. So you're not getting like a bait and switch there. Wow. Oh wow, that yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's great, great stuff. We're gonna have to check that out. Man, that's so convenient. Like I'm I'm trying to describe what it looks like, and you're just like, here you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Worlds within worlds, the internet. Yeah. It's great. Well, um, I um, think that's all I'm kind of like current on, I guess, reading wise. Oh, I read a bunch of Ninjak recently too. That shit was awesome. Like old school or new school? Both. I started reading the <laughs> old, like initial Valiant launch stuff because I had never read it before. And then I tore through a bunch of the Matt Kint, uh, Clayman, and Juan Jose Rip stuff, which is really good. Nice. I remember being a kid and loving Ninjak. It was that that chromium cover or whatever the hell it was. It was just dope. I first <laughs> saw him in a wizard magazine that my neighbor gave me because he was just like a couple years older than me. He was like, here, I don't need these anymore. And, uh, <laughs> and I was just like, you know, I was obsessed with ninjas like through – childhood ninja turtles mortal Kombat, all that stuff so it was like i remember it was like 94 95 and i was just like wow look at this guy and i would sit there and draw a ninja not having any idea what valiant was or any of that stuff just that he looked cool all i ever wanted to be when i was growing up was a, a staffer at wizard ever like all oh, I ever yeah wanted. yeah but i feel you know it's kind of what we're doing now we're keeping the the whole thing alive here on youtube with the the YouTube comic book community, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, well, you know, we brought up working on Superman, uh, but you're also one of the biggest Bond fans I've ever met. And uh, you did get a chance to work on some really cool uh, James Bond stuff. So I was going to ask, what, what was that experience like? Man, that was so awesome. Like uh, specifically, getting to do solstice james bond solstice is a um a 30 page one shot that i wrote and drew with uh jordan boyd on colors and simon balland on lettering um that was a dream project because it was like so at the time i was slated to work on james bond origin with jeff parker and there were all these delays in that book getting going i'm not sure why it was stuff with the licensor and and you know dynamite is weird and so it was taken forever. And uh, so I had to do some other stuff. And uh, I had pitched, like the editor said, hey, you know, you're, you know, you're Bond. Like we have a, we have a two issue arc that we need to fill in this James Bond origin story. Like Jeff's got, you know, 10 issues figured out so far, but why don't you pitch an idea for a two issue arc that you and Jeff will co-write and i was like oh my god yeah like so uh i pitched something and the fleming people really dug it and said actually let's make this let's expand expand this a little bit so they you know so we made it a three issue thing so that was still taking its time to get going and then um the editor said hey i've got a james bond holiday special that i'm editing do you want to pitch something for it? And I was like, Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> so I just took like 24 hours and I thought about it. And then I, you know, immediately like got back to him, like, you know, okay, here's what I'm thinking. And they were into it. And so I got to, you know, write and draw it. And it's, it's a self-contained story. And, uh, you know, it, being such a bond fan and like a Fleming bond aficionado, like I, I feel like I was really able to hit on a bunch of notes that were like true to the character. Um, so yeah, Fable says that's the one hole in my nerddom. I've only seen like two Bond movies. I've always wanted to binge them. Oh man, they're great. Like there's a lot of stinkers in there though. I won't lie to you. Like they're, uh, yeah. this, the Connery ones start off pretty strong and then they start to get kind of goofy. And then the whole Roger Moore era is just, there are a couple of gems in there, but they're pretty they're pretty hard to get through. Um, I think if you saw them when you were a kid, yes, they're like awesome, right? But <laughs> yeah. when it's a little different. Is, <laughs> yeah, when when nostalgia is not a factor, they are rough. <laughs> yeah. um, the Dalton ones are great. He's only in two of them. Station. 
Yeah. Timothy Dalton is one of the most undervalued James Bonds we've ever had. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I'll tell you why. It's because there was such like a, a big fandom for the, the Roger Moore era. Yeah. That because again, you know, there were a bunch of guys who watched the Connery Bonds as kids. Or, you know, not as kids, but when they were younger. Then they grew up and had kids. And they were like, oh, check this out, son. You'll love this. James Bond. And it was Roger Moore. They were going to the theater, seeing Roger Moore Bond and stuff. Or watching him on video or TV or whatever. So then those guys grew up. And when Dalton became Bond, they were like, what? This isn't Bond. This guy sucks. And it's like... <laughs> It's because he's not running across alligators or looking at the camera going, oh, I don't have a show. You know, I mean, that's <laughs> so <laughs> like Dalton was doing what Daniel Craig did with Bond. He was taking it back to Fleming and he was being serious. And, you know, Dalton is a, is one of the greatest actors of his generation. Like he's a Shakespearean like stage actor who, you know, made it in films. And and so. I think I just had an affinity for Dalton because of the Rocketeer. Cause I loved that movie as a kid. <laughs> and so by the time I, I didn't see the Dalton ones until maybe like five years ago. And oh, wow. I was like, these are fucking great. What is everybody on about? Like Dude, they're all in daylights is amazing. Like that's a, I, that's a top five bond movie. Easy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, yeah. and, and one of the best theme songs too, yes. like 100%. Yeah. Uh, and that sweet ass car. That's the one where the car goes underwater, right? No, With that's, the- um, that's, uh, the spy who loved me. That was the Lotus Esprit that went underwater. Okay. But Dalton had the one that had skis. That's right. <laughs> Which that's right. is yeah. still corny, but uh, pretty. D- that's my favorite uh, Aston Martin too. The, the, I think it's a vantage from like a- 85. I want to say 84, 85. Um, but uh, yeah, Dalton's great. All of the, the Brosnan ones are hit or miss, but all the Craig ones, with the exception of Spectre, are fantastic. You, yeah. you start, Fable, start with the, uh, was it Fable? Did I get that right? Yeah. Start yeah. with uh, Casino Royale. It's on Netflix. It's yeah. it's the best Bond movie. It's a perfect film. Also, directed by Martin Campbell, who did The Mask of Zorro. So, two perfect films in that man's oeuvre. I, uh, I really like Quantum of Solace. Like a Dude. lot. Yes. And most people don't. Yes. But I love that movie so much, man. 100%. See, like, I saw that in the theater first. And to me, like, I know, and other people brought this up, like, watching that directly after Casino Royale, like, is that, is, makes it a, a pretty good experience. You know, yeah. that one of the things that hurt Quantum of Solace is that came out uh, during, um, uh, like, the writer's strike and all that stuff. So, like, yeah. it, it kind of suffered. I think it suffered a little bit from that. Like, it, you know, it's one of the shorter ones and yeah. Yeah. Make sure it's the second one. Yeah. The first, you don't want to watch Woody Allen as James Bond. No, yeah. No, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not good. Um, uh, but, but yeah, the, um, I, I did that, you know, I watched, you know, Casino Royale and then watched Quantum Solace right afterwards. And man, it, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So Fable, Quantum is, is like a direct sequel to Casino Royale. And that's the first time they've really done that in a Bond movie. Um, and so it, to, to go into that one with Casino Royale under your belt really will set the stage for you better. But yeah, I love, I love Quantum of Solace. I, I saw it in the theater and was like, what did I, I don't get what happened in that movie. And then I remember watching it when it came out on DVD and going, oh, how was I confused by this? Like, this is very coherent. Like it all makes sense. And yeah. I think maybe because they were doing the post Jason Bourne, like very, erratic camera stuff for the fight scenes and some of it, it was a little confusing to me but i mean man that car chase in the beginning is one of the best car chases oh. on film yeah yes. and then the foot chase through i think it was like italy or spain or something is absolutely fantastic like um yeah that that one is one of the more like fleming bond movies in terms of like tone mm-hmm. and plot and stuff um i i love that movie it's yeah that's one of my favorites for sure. Hell yeah. yeah. So are you, you're, you're a big fan of the novels. Yes. Okay. Brian, what were you saying? Well, I was going to say, uh, cause when you mentioned that, uh, you know, with Solstice, like you use Mathis as one of the characters, which, you know, I don't, other than Casino Royale, I think, I don't think he was used much in 
in the movies, you know, and that's like, I thought that was a really cool tie. Yeah. Tie in there. Sorry. Apologies. My nephew is texting me, David, who, you know, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I've been helping him with his homework. I just got to let him know that, uh, I forgot <laughs> to tell him I was doing this and he's probably like, well, dude, why aren't you picking up? <laughs> yeah. He is probably the funniest person you'll ever meet. By the way. Hilarious kid. He is awesome. <laughs> um, uh, what were we talking about? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, Mathis. Yeah. So that's a character who's in the novel Casino Royale. So he's in the very first mm-hmm. Bond book, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to, to, you know, pay a little tribute to that in the, in the book. Cause I don't think he was in any of the comics, his character. I think that was the only <clears throat> appearance and I didn't even show him. It was just like a phone call. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I thought that was a cool touch. Thanks, man. Yeah, I that was a fun. The the that sequence was interesting because, <laughs> so in in Solstice, um, Bond goes to Paris on a sort of unofficial favor mission for M, right? And he can't take a gun with him because you can't bring a gun from England into Paris, like or into France, um. And he's not on official business, so he doesn't have any kind of clearance to do so, nor does he have access to, like, here's your weapons arsenal, James Bond, you know, because it's, like, uh, off the books. So he calls Mathis, who works at the French intelligence service, and is just, he tells him, like, in code, like, hey, I'm I'm traveling to uh, Paris, and I forgot my jacket. And, uh, and there's a, something called like the hard rule, I believe is the thing that says you can't bring a gun or whatever. So he says like, and the hard rule has me traveling a little light these days. Uh, in fact, I've lost a little bit of weight just under my left shoulder, like where his gun would be. Right. So <laughs> Mathis sets him up with his, uh, like tailor and is like, you know, go see this man about a coat. And then he goes to get the coat and inside it is a gun. Right. So yeah. how that came about was, uh, the editor wanted he suggested that there be some kind of beat where bond like beats up a rude rich guy and steals his coat from him and i was like what and he was like yeah i would just show that he you know and and this editor is great i'm not throwing shade at him i love the guy but like it was a weird suggestion and i didn't really know what to do with it it's like the whole what let, let's have Superman fight a polar bear thing. That yeah, it was it was like I, I don't know. Like, and again, it's kind of like having somebody tell me what to wear, right? I was like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so, um, I came up with this thing where, like, he this guy there, she's checking at the hotel, and this guy's rude to him, and so he, they're in the elevator. The elevator closes. The elevator opens. The guy's like knocked out, and Bond is wearing his coat, right? Cause the whole coat thing was like, maybe the editor was like, maybe he doesn't wear, he doesn't bring a coat. So he needs to get a coat. So you just show him get a coat. And I was like, what is fucking coat? So. <laughs> Did so, they have more pages they needed? Like, we want this to have like three more pages. <laughs> I don't know, man. And I, you know, it was, it was the only the second time, uh, you know, a work for hire thing had me go, Hey, pitch us an idea. And he was both times. He was the first and second. So I was like, all right, well, this guy's giving me a shot. Let me, you know, I'm not going to be picky here. Yeah. Uh, I'm new to this, you know? So, um, so I wrote that in the treatment and, and we sent it and I tried to do it. You remember, remember in Casino Royale when, uh, the guy thinks he's a valet. And so he, he like does a fender bender with the guy's car just for being a dick to him thinking maybe he was a valet. Yeah. I was kind of doing an, a play on that idea, right? Like I wanted it to kind of feel the same way. Cause that was the only way I could think of to make it work. And so the the Fleming people were like, he needs more coats. <laughs> uh, so the Fleming people were like, hey, so we really like this, but what's with this coat thing? Like what? And and so the editor was like, hey, so they really like it except for this coat bit. Do you remember <laughs> what? And he's like, it, it had been like a month. He's like, do you remember why you wrote that? And I was like, you told me to write that. And he was like, oh, well, feel free to tell me to shut up next time. I was like. <laughs> <We'll> do. <laughs> so I said, all right, but I have a different idea. What if that's how we get him a gun? So in the end, it, it ended up being a cool thing the way it played out. But it was like this weird roundabout of like, I don't know what to do with this fucking coat, man. Like, what do you want? To do? And you so, get notes back. We like it, but the coat bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was pretty funny. 
But it made me feel good because I was like, all right, well, the Fleming people like what I did, except for the part I didn't do. So maybe I'm on the right track, you know? So. So do you just like Bond? Or are you an action movie fan in general? Both. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love action stuff. I love, you know, I mean, like I was saying, John Wick is one of my favorite movies. I think that that movie just really nails all that stuff perfectly. Um, and so I, I really enjoy putting that stuff into comics, which is why putting action scenes into the story of the Count of Monte Cristo was like a, a big deal for me because I really wanted it to feel like I wanted the book to have the the feeling of like the an experience of watching an action movie or, you know, like, you know, when you sit down and you just watch a dope movie and you're like, man, that was great. Like, that's what I hope people get out of this book is just the feeling of like two hours plus of escapism. And like, you know, that, that feeling of like, yeah, I, I just watched some cool shit happen. You I know? think it works because you got some scenes that are, mm-hmm. that are dense and they, 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 they have weight to them and it paces the story. Right. And then you have these long sequence of pages with just action scenes that are just thrilling. I Thanks, mean, it man. is like you feel the motion. Like it's, it's very well done. Y'all need to check out count when it comes out from human. Thank you, man. Yeah. If anybody's interested in seeing a trailer for it, if you go to countcomic.com, uh, I made a, a movie style trailer for it. Um, and, uh, there's a link, you know, you basically can, there's two buttons, watch trailer by now. <laughs> and under the buy now one, you can, you can use the local comic shop locator website to find your nearest comic shop. Um, there's a link to Barnes and Noble. There's a link to bookshop.com, which is a site that like, basically takes proceeds and donates a portion to local bookstores. Um, It's like a nice alternative to Amazon. Um, And then there's also an Amazon link because as much as I hate to say it, let's face it, we all use Amazon and it's like in a lot of cases, especially during a pandemic, the easiest way for some people to get stuff sent to them. So um, however, however it works best for you, you know, do it, do it to it. And also I should mention March 16th is when it hits bookstores. The 17th is when it hits comic shops. The 16th is my birthday. So if people want to, you know, throw a, little, throw a little purchase of the book uh, for, for my birthday, I wouldn't be mad at it. I'd appreciate what a, it. What a better <laughs> birthday present, PCP Army, than buying Ibrahim's new book. Come on. Please and thank you. It's, a, it's too serendipitous to pass up, right? Trust me. It's really <laughs> good. Trust me. It's worth it, PCP Army. Trust me. Thank you, man. And yeah, and, you know, I I'm really happy with the way it turned out also in terms of like it's 120 pages, which is a six issue, you know, length of something for 20 bucks and it's got some cool back matter and uh, you know, nice spot varnishes on the cover. So I'm I'm really happy with the package that they were able to put together for it and the value that you get with it. So Nice. And everybody local, we will be carrying it at the Deep Comics and Games. So come on and get your copy. Yes, please do. And you can actually, Brian will be there signing in Ibrahim's stead. So if you want to sketch <laughs> yes. in there, Brian's going to do a little sketch for you. Actually, you know what? I'll tell you what. I have a, I have a drawing of, of the main character right here. I'll, oh, cool. uh, I'll, I'll, I still have to sign it still, I'll, I'll, but um, I'll, uh, I'll get the address to your shop and I'll send it in. And then whoever buys a copy of the book there, if you want to like write their names down and then pick one at random to, you know, they can win the sketch or something. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Totally. That. We'll do that. Yes. Cool. Absolutely. Awesome. Hell yeah. That's dope. All right. So aside from James Bond, what's the greatest action franchise out there? Oh, mission impossible all day. Oh, bro. <laughs> like I always hated the Mac, the mission impossible movies. Cause I only watched the first two yeah. and I hate mission impossible too. And then my homie Drew has always been trying to get me to watch them. And so last summer we did this thing every summer called Action Fest, where we just celebrate action films. Nice. So we did a whole night. I was like, we're finally going to do it. We're going to watch all the Mission Impossible films. Bruh, those last three are some of like, I really feel like Fallout may be one of the best action movies I've ever seen. Agreed. Like, no, franchises don't get better like this, but right. this one did. Holy cow, those last three. Uh, anyway, why, you know why Mission Impossible? I <laughs> actually love Mission Impossible 3 also. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's, it's decent. There, it's very polarizing. And I think a lot of, I think if JJ Abrams name was not attached to it, people would like it more, but I think his name just has a lot of baggage to it. Honestly. It does, um, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you're, I'm with you. The first, you know, 
it's funny the kind of like snobbery that goes along with um the Mission Impossible franchise because <laughs> there are people who are like, bro, Brian De Palma, it's amazing, it's a masterpiece, and I'm like, that movie's boring as shit. Like, I'm sorry, it's boring. Like, there's cool stuff in it, but it's a boring movie. Uh, a, a great cast, right? Like, very cool. See, I mean, the helicopter thing at the end is is cool, you know. But yeah, the Mission Impossible Two is like a Mountain Dew commercial for two hours, like, you know. <laughs> I mean, it definitely has its moments and there's some cool stuff about it. But again, like it, it feels like Goldeneye, like that era of just like corny kind of like, you know, a little bit over the top, weird musical cues, you know, then three like takes it back to earth. I feel like it grounds it yeah. and the stakes in that movie feel so high. I mean, when Carrie Russell's characters fucking head, it, like which doesn't explode, but like a bomb goes off in her head. And yeah within the first 15 minutes of the movie and I, I'll never forget the way she just, uh, and like her, you know, the thing happens and her eyes go sideways and it's just like, Oh my God, she's dead. Like, yeah, I thought Felicity was in this movie. This is <laughs> <Right. laughs> And it's also the first one that has a proper villain, like, yes. like an actual well-rounded villain. Yeah. Know? And Philip Seymour Hoffman. And he's like, so evil in it. And yeah, man. So I, I love that movie. Um, and it's, it's got fun, you know, kind of globe trotting, like spy stuff in it. Um, the, the face mask things they do are always cool. And that's one of the things I love about the franchise is they always find a way yeah. <laughs> to do that in a new, you know, little twist to it. Um, but yeah, I, I love those movies, man. I, I think, uh, I, I know Tom Cruise is crazy, but I just love the guy. I can't help it. I love his movies, man. You know? Yeah. Those last three are freaking amazing. I really like, uh, is it ghost protocol? I don't know. The one that has like Jeremy Renner in it the most, but, uh, what's that? I think that was ghost protocol. Yeah, I think so. That that's, or, a, no, no, no. Was it, um, rogue nation, rogue nation, rogue nation. No, or no, no. Maybe, maybe go ghost. Ghost protocol was the fourth one, right? That's the one where they go to Dubai. Yeah. 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 And he's cl that he climbing on the outside of that climbing. building. Yeah. Yes. Oh my. And he's like actually doing that. Like, yeah, because he's just, protocol. he's just freaking crazy. Yeah. You know, I remember hearing the thing. It was like Top Gun's been delayed because Tom Cruise is going to learn how to fly a jet. Like, of course, like as Tom Cruise must do. And now they're yeah. shipping him off to space. Yeah. That's good. You know, you mentioned John Wick a lot. I've never seen the John Wick movies. Never. Really? Yeah. Never, ever. But I, I, I really like Keanu. We're Robbie. obviously big. We're obviously big Bill and Ted fans here. Robbie, but, uh, yeah, you you gotta watch John Wick, man. You gotta That's watch. Right I have watched the first one and absolutely loved it. By the way, are the are the other two good or is it? So you can stop at one. Honestly, I love oh. I love the franchise. A three was a little gratuitous for me. Three was like, all right, well, these are really successful. Well, let's do another one. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's not bad, but like. So the first one has these cool elements of like there's this underground world of assassins, right? Mm -hmm. And you get you get glimpses of it in the first one. And then I in, in two and three, they're really just like, all right, well, we're flow full blown in this kind of fantastical underworld. And that to me kind of lost me a little bit. So mm -hmm. I I would advocate, you know. If if they're if they're accessible to you easily and you've got nothing else to do, certainly watch them. Keanu's the best, right? But yeah. if, if all you watch is John Wick one, that's all you need. It's so good. Um yeah. man, it's it's tough too if you love dogs. Like it is. I've heard that. Yeah. Uh, I'm more of a cat guy, so I'm cool with it. And you know it's funny, I didn't have I didn't have when when I first so I'm I'm married and we have two dogs, one of which my wife had for about six months before we met. And we had a, a tenuous relationship, me and that dog. She's not a Brian's met her. She's, she's not very sociable. She's, she's untrusting of people, especially men. And so it took a while to like get her to warm up to me. And I wasn't into dogs. So I was like, I don't care. You be over there. I'll be over here. You know, and then over the years now, I mean, she's my child. Like, uh, she, you know, she she's even kind of a daddy's girl now. Like, she she looks to me even more than my wife sometimes, which is wild because my wife is like her world, you know. Um, so when I first saw that movie, 
my wife and I have been dating for like a month or two and like I wasn't invested in the dog yet. So I found that moment sad, but I was like, oh, it's like Bambi's mom. What, what did Chandler on Friends say about Bambi's mom? He was like, oh yeah, I was real sad when they stopped drawing the deer. Like <laughs> it didn't register to me as like a, you know, a death. It was like, oh, they, they cut it from the movie after that, you know? Yeah. Um, but man, once I, once I became invested in the dogs and I watch, I can't, every time I watch it, I cry now. It's crazy. Ted Theodore Logan as an assassin. What more can you want? Jacques Matrix. says <laughs> it's true. It's true. He's yeah. I, I'm a big, big matrix fan too. Like, oh, yeah. bruh. And, and so, you know, and I loved speed as a kid, the movie, oh. not the drug, you know? So like, uh, <laughs> just to big, clarify. Yeah. So I was a big Keanu fan already. Um, and in fact, my love of collecting figures was sparked by the McFarlane Matrix stuff. Oh. So when like John Wick came out, uh, no, no, I <laughs> I like the first two. <clears throat> the first one obviously is a masterpiece. Uh, the second one I enjoy a lot. I think it was the second one's it, really better than most people think. I or remember, and I'm glad you I mentioned really that. I like the second one. I yeah. love I love all three. That's just me. But like the second one, I think is like, <laughs> I don't think we, the best scene, the best action scene in the entire trilogy is that freeway mm -hmm. scene. Like that just yeah. blows my mind every yeah. time. And that one doesn't even have Neo until the very right. end of it. Right. So it's like, you're getting that without the super Saiyan, you know, abilities and stuff. Like it's just them struggling to survive. Um, yeah. I think, I think two, it's interesting. I took, I did that DC comics workshop, the talent workshop a few years ago. And, uh, Klaus Jansen was one of the instructors and she, he was talking about <clears throat> how comics are so interesting because it's like the only medium where I, and I'm paraphrasing, I could be getting this a little bit wrong, but it's the only medium where you have an image that could be completely different depending on the image that comes right after it. Right. Okay. So you could have a panel of a house and the panel after that house could be anything and it can drastically impact what the, what that house image means. Right. Yeah. And the matrix movies are kind of like that. Like the second one is that house and it's either an incredible house or like, depending on what comes after it, it's not that great of a house <laughs> to me. I think it's an incredible house. I think the image that comes after it is not a great house and it, and it tarnishes the one before it, you know what I mean? So um, yeah, I love, I love revolution or reloaded. I could watch yeah. reloaded over and over again. Revolutions. I feel like doesn't stick the landing necessarily. Huh. It is. I did rewatch it recently and it's better than I remembered it being. I will say that. It I think, I think it is. I think a lot of people, I, I, it's kind of like when you have expectation and it was yeah. hard to go into the finale of the matrix without an expectation. And they gave us something a lot more kind of cerebral and philosophical for an right. ending, I think. And I don't right. think yeah. that people were ready for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just, as literal as it seemed like it should have been. Like it wasn't as, as definitively like, here's what happened, you know? Yeah. Well, well, what I remember is the action. There was the action was like far toned down. And so there was always like, it was more of like a menace thing. Yeah. Like you're, you're waiting for something bad to happen, you know? And, and that, cause I, I, I mainly remember just being kind of bored. Like what? Yeah, this is taking a long time. <laughs> yeah, watch it again, man. Because when it when when the when the machines come down and they're in those like aliens like exo squad things and like yeah. that's that's action freaking packed, man. But it's very mm -hmm. typical. It's not like it doesn't break new ground visually like one and two right. did. That's true. Like that's true. I don't know for me, but like and then it goes off into this. It takes like Trinity ten minutes to die. It's just yeah. I get it. But <laughs> yeah, and then the weird baby face thing was to like. It's like, did Neo <laughs> die in the Matrix or in the real world? Like, what? Like, why is and, he but, blind but, now? But he, you know. And what? What? I like the blind thing because that ties into some mythology. You know, you give away your physical sight for for inner sight or something right. like that, right? He got and, the he got the Daredevil vision. Yeah, right. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and he plucked his eye out like Odin or Horus or whatever. You know. Or, yeah. Yeah. So you know, that's a good I, point. Yeah. And I did. I thought. I thought when when the machines are storming Zion, like 
it did feel very Helms deep in that sense of just like, man, this is hopeless, you know? Yeah. So that, that was cool. And I think that kind of goes into what you were saying, cause about the, the menace, the overall menace of it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I remember hating that, 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 uh, Smith downloaded himself onto someone who looked vaguely like him. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> But the overall concept of him being able to do that was cool. Yeah. And I, and I remember hating that and I've since come around to it. Yeah, me too. And and what because I was very confused about what was going on with Smith in those in that last movie. Mm -hmm. And then when you realize that I don't know, it's it's really interesting. Like when you start there's like I got the Blu-ray set and there's like there's two sets of commentaries. There's one by like film critics that didn't really like the movies. They thought they were okay. And then there's one by philosophers who love the movies. And it's a really? really cool. Yeah. It's like a really cool juxtaposition to listen I to. Wonder, both I wonder if I have that. Cause I bought them on Blu-ray like a year ago. You and probably I do. Yeah. yeah because it, it, I think even a uh, Cornell West, Cornell West is one of the, the commentators. Oh, okay. I think, so that's, cause he's a big fan. He's actually in, uh, that's I think right. he's, he's in, in he's like, one of the, like, yeah, he's, on he's the like one of the council people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, super cool. And yeah, Animatrix, by the way, tomorrow is oh, yeah. freaking dope. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. straight up. Straight I gotta rewatch that. That was so cool. Yeah. Man. It really did you is. ever did you ever play the games? No. Nah. Not were they on Super Nintendo? Then no. no. Then no. They, <laughs> man, so so they came out with one called Enter the Matrix, where you played as yeah. Niobe, who was the Jada Pinkett Smith yeah, that, character. That was the bridge between like one and two or something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then they came out years later with one called The Path of Neo, where you play as Neo throughout his journey in the Matrix. And it's so cool because they'll do stuff where like, you know, so you start off as him in the office, right? And you're like hiding around cubicles and you're climbing outside on the building and stuff. And then once you're jacked into the, you know, you're, you've been uh, red pilled or whatever and you're, you know, you're on the Nebuchadnezzar. They run you through training simulations and they're like old samurai movies, like like black and white Kurosawa style or like ghost. You know, you're fighting ghosts in these old samurai ghost story simulations and stuff. So it's really cool. They 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 add to it. You know, there's a level where it's like a it's like a Chow Yun Fat um, John Woo movie. I can't remember which one they're they're it's like a better tomorrow or something where you're like diving and shooting and, you know, yeah, you're in like, like a restaurant. Uh, I don't, I don't remember. It's, it's like the actual like Chinese movies he was. Okay. In. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So it's really cool. Like it takes you through all that. And then, you know, it, you do all the stuff. There's the lobby scene and you can do the cartwheel and shoot. There's the rooftop and you're, you're dodging the stuff. You know, Travis says I'm worth it. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really dope. It's actually one that I, like, I don't have time to play games a lot, but I will pop that one in every now and then. Cause you can just kind of pick it up and, you know, and the combat is fantastic. And you fight. There's that courtyard scene with all the Smiths. Oh, really? they're just fighting Smiths. It's crazy, man. It's so cool. Like, yeah, it's it's super fun. So, highly recommended. Are you, uh, Robbie? Are you more retro retro gamer? You don't you don't mess with the anything above sixteen bit or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear thirty two is supposed to be a big deal. Yeah. So I'm really I'm thinking about getting that thirty two X for my Genesis. But uh, yeah, I'm a little bit more old school just because I. I'm sure you have the same thing. It's hard to find time to play games nowadays. Take so long. Like, but I can put in a, I can put in Paperboy and play for 15 minutes, get pissed off, and I'm satisfied. Right, so. right. <laughs> Man, I've really been wanting to build a custom cabinet for like the, the last year or so. Dude, my homie partner here at PCP, John, did that, and it's majestic. He got yeah. an actual like arcade panel from like Japan, and he like we went over there one time and we were playing like the new Street Fighter and. Like, do you like fighting games? I know you were talking about Mortal Kombat. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, man, Mortal Kombat. The I first played that on my friend Sega back in like 94, 93, 94. And uh, I was blown away. Like, he was the kid who got all the cool shit. And I was the poor kid who didn't, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> Fables is getting you a PS1 for Christmas. <laughs> okay, I nice. got to get into I got to get into my favorite PS1 game real quick. But yeah, Mortal Kombat 1 on my friend Sega. And then uh, Mortal Kombat 2 was coming, and Game Informer magazine had this Mortal Kombat issue that I bought at the local Safeway. And it had still shots from like a, a commercial that they had done where they had actors in costumes. I don't know if you remember that commercial. Um, but 
so Shao Kahn was on the cover and it looked so cool. And I was just like, I need that. And I flipped it open and it had Super Nintendo, Sega, Game Boy, Game Gear. And it, it ran out the, the, the moves for every character except for the fatalities, right? So I sat there and at the time we only had a Nintendo on a black and white TV. My dad was like determined to keep us poor and like not into anything cool. So like everyone was getting Super Nintendos. And his coworker got one for his kids. And he was like, they're not going to play this Nintendo anymore if you want it for your kids. So my that's the only reason we had it. And my uncle was like, I'm giving you my Game Boy next time I come to visit you. And I was just like, amazing. So I would practice because I had the same controller set up. I would practice the Mortal Kombat 2 moves from that magazine on this Nintendo controller. <laughs> so that by the time I got that Game Boy and my copy of Mortal Kombat 2 for it, I would just be like unstoppable. I wasn't. But I knew the move. <laughs> but real quick, because Fable brought up PS1. You guys ever play it? Well, maybe not Robbie, but Ten <laughs> Tenchu Stealth Assassins. You heard of this game for PS1? Yeah, sounds familiar. It is a stealth action ninja game that takes place in feudal Japan. It's not. It's huh. it's pretty grounded. You know, there's a few fantastical things in it, but it, it's not like. Ninja Gaiden or something. It's it's closer to Metal Gear Solid. Like okay, you you have to sneak around. If you get spotted by the guards, you're kind of screwed. You get score. You get ranked based on how many times you got seen or didn't get seen. So it's all about yeah. getting the stealth kill. You literally got to creep up behind people and right. Uh, cool. Yeah, and you're like you you serve this this like noble lord, right? So you're like a good guy. There's throwing stars in it. There's a grappling hook. You climb on rooftops. You got to hide in the shadows. It's amazing. I first played it in my friend's house in eighth grade. And I was just like, I don't, I just needed whatever I can do to get a PlayStation. I'm going to do it. Like I was like selling stuff. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's an awesome game. Yeah. I think that Metal Gear Solid was why I bought the PlayStation one or PlayStation two in the first place. Cause I, I went over to a friend's house, played that. And I was like, this game is amazing. Yeah, same. So, but yeah, so Tenchu, what Tenchu? Was Tenchu? Yeah, yeah, Tenchu Stealth Assassins. Um, okay. I, it's pretty easy to get. It was a PlayStation's greatest hits game at one point, so it was like super cheap. And um, yeah, it's so fun, man. That's another one. You know, it it was before the open world kind of games, so like, you know, that's kind of linear. Thing. Well, each level, I mean, it's it's a it's the three D uh, third person you know, action style game. Um, and it's not an RPG. So it's like everything you do, you know, if you crouch, you crouch, if you throw a throwing star, you throw, it. you know what mm -hmm. I mean? You're not like hitting a thing and then watching your character go ah, and then come back to yeah. resting or whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, man, like it's all about hiding and stuff. And, and so every level is like its own map, right? So the very mm -hmm. first level is like this little, you know, portion of like the Japanese town, right? And you have to find this evil merchant and like punish him. And then the second level is this little village and you got to get from one end to the other. So it's like, it's open within the map, right? Yeah. And, but every level has a set task. So you're not like, it's not like the modern games where you go like, oh, okay, let me go to the next checkpoint. Oh, but this person wants me to find their cat or whatever, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. All these things to keep you in it forever. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I have uh, definitely with uh, when Ari was born, uh, I have not had time to play any video games. I did find this game. It's a, a platformer. Uh, it's called uh, Gris. That's a French word for gray. And uh, it was just highly recommended. And there was a, uh, I, I remember when I was reading it, it said the recommended time was like four hours or something like that. And I was like, oh, that's sweet. That's like ideal for me because I can only yeah. play like 30 minutes to an hour, you know, and it still took me uh, two months <laughs> yeah. to get through that four hour game. Yeah, man. A lot of these games are like a full time job. It's crazy. I, I, so I, to Robbie's point, yeah, like if you can just pop a cartridge in and knock it out, man, that's that's yeah. that's pretty, you know. I was going to say uh, bringing up uh, Metal Gear Solid, um, you know, uh, I recommend the audience check out Green's uh, page that that commission you did with the Metal Gear Solid from, uh, was that Metal Gear Solid 5? Oh, uh, yeah. Recently? The Phantom Pain, yeah. Yeah. I highly check that out. That was, I mean, I highly recommend checking that out. It's 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 really dope. Thank you, man. And, uh, that was a fun one, yeah. 
I did that right after your Superman, actually. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 I uh, I played that game and uh, I, I just cracked Deanna up because after a while she knew that she had to like text me or something before she would come down and ask me a question while I was playing that game because I would just be like locked in this, you know, <laughs> insanely tense position all the time. And she would say something and I'd just about fall out of the chair. So, yeah, I, I haven't played that one, but I, I watched a bunch of gameplay on YouTube as like research mm-hmm. for that commission. Uh, yeah. And it, it looked bad. I, one of these days I'll sit down with it. it. The mechanics of the game are like, they're about the best I've ever played. Like, I yeah. mean, it, like you really feel like you're in it. It's really cool. Most recent game I played was Ghost of Tsushima. Where it's like you're a samurai and it's like, it's like Red Dead Redemption in Japan. It's it's amazing. Like it's it's the, the dopest game I've ever played. <laughs> the graphics on it look absolutely stunning. I I really do want to play that one, but again, I, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's so funny. It, it was like, really you, good. Yeah, you turn like toward the sun, and you're just like, ah, oh, damn, my foot. <laughs> yeah, it's great, man. It's just just a awesome, awesome game all around. But anyway, sorry, I don't mean to talk about a bunch of shit that Robbie's not uh, gonna have. No, that's fine. Any kind of you know. That's fine. That's good. That's groovy, guys. Because the I remember the when the last okay, so I've had I've guys, I've played a PS1 and two and three. <laughs> you know, I haven't gone beyond a three. Uh I don't have one. I had a PS3 because I love baseball and so I loved MLB the show and I would play that all the time. And I would literally spend like six hours playing this damn game, just like trying to like go through all these seasons and become like an all-star character because I put right. myself in the game and I was like, what am I doing? I'm just I'm just fake playing baseball, having fake success. Anyway, <laughs> I have a question for you, Ibrahim. Have you yeah. ever experienced anything weird, supernatural? You ever seen a UFO, aliens in the sky, a ghost, um, anything unexplained? Has anything like that ever happened to you that you'd like nah, to talk man. about? No, man. I've always wanted that to happen to me, but it's just it's never been the case. Yeah? Well, yeah. you've always wanted it. So one day it will happen. So keep Yeah, going. Keep I, I want, I, like, you know, I mean, I don't necessarily, at this point in, in adulthood, I don't really want aliens to show up. I don't, I can't, we just <laughs> lived through. We've been through too much. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying, right? Like, I would just be like, all right, come on, right? And everybody would be like, oh, hashtag 2021, hashtag aliens or whatever, you know, it'd be <laughs> like, come on, 2021. It'd be a bunch of dumb memes and shit. Meanwhile, we're being invaded by fucking extraterrestrial. Anyway, I'd be so, sharing uh, those memes. Yeah, I'd be like, and I, I just, told y'all. <laughs> I I've heard stories of people like swear they saw a ghost or a gin or whatever you know cultural thing it is, and I I'd be like, man, that'd be cool, but I just I think my brain won't let me believe in it, and so therefore it'll never happen to me. Exactly. Yeah. You get, I did people that are more I, people that like are people that believe in that more, I think it happens to more, you know? Yeah. And what I think is it's the same phenomena that's happening across the centuries. Like whether you want to call it a demon or an angel or the Virgin Mary or an alien, it's like whatever, like why does the alien stuff start happening after Roswell's? Because that's in the public consciousness. Right. right? And so there's some ideas about that or whatever. Do you have any thoughts about the government, you know, basically saying these are unidentified flying objects that we've seen and, what do you have you have you paid attention to any of that? Because they started releasing this stuff during the pandemic when it first started. And I, I kept going, why are they doing this now? Yeah. Like, I feel like they're trying to build us up to some kind of bullshit. That's just me personally. I but, think we were in a massive cycle of look at the keys, right? And so part of me thinks that those were just jingly keys to make us uh distract from the fact that we were being robbed of all of our fucking freedoms and money and you know what I mean like <laughs> um I mean yeah <laughs> but, you know I, I I don't doubt that those were experiences that people had you know like like you hear those pilots in those videos going like what is this thing or like rock yeah. that nothing just disappeared you know uh so I don't know I mean uh there's always some kind of explanation right and I it's hard to know if the explanation is any more bullshit than like the theory or, you know, whatever was proposed in the first place. But absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, like I'm also um, like from, you know, I was raised religious and from a very young age, I remember, and no offense to anybody, but I remember just being like, 
you guys know you can't live inside of a whale, right? Like this is being this is the gospel here. Like what? Like <laughs> you guys are trying to tell me that this is like I need to live and die by the tenets in this book that tells me that a dude lived in a whale. <laughs> like, come on. So I've always been a skeptic as far as that stuff is concerned, you know, or like, yeah. what about the dinosaurs guys? Like what? You know, I remember watching this video of this dude trying to scientifically prove that it was possible that you could live in a whale. They're like, no, like he could, he could only just be living there, laying down, laying down. If he was just still like, and like, and I was just like, what? Cause I, I was raised religious too. And I even trained to be a preacher um, in the Christianity and Baptist denomination. Yeah. And, uh, and that, you know, it's like, and I was away, even me who was a believer at the time, I was just like, the guys, I think this is just an allegory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, like no, you, no, no, it's they, literal. And you got to treat people uh, like shit based on uh, that. So I was like, bro, go, you, you, know? you know that even back then they, they understood subtext. You understand yeah. that, right? Like they, they, what? It'd be like somebody reading like a, a Superman comic and being like, yo, <laughs> did you believe really they believe this? <laughs> yeah. I've honestly, if it, if I have said this to friends before, you know, when they've asked me about like, why aren't, why aren't you believing, you know? And I was like, look, if Superman came about in an era where nobody was going to make money off of it and it wasn't like intentionally a commercial enterprise. In 2000 years, we would think this motherfucker was real and he was flying around and he wore this outfit. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, a uh, very long game of telephone in a lot of respects. Yeah, that, you know, you know. I've always <laughs> been like, what if these idols that we keep finding were just action figures? Prototypical action figures. I, that I can get behind. <laughs> yeah, wait, you know wait, what? Yeah. You just converted me, man. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure you're not a preacher? That's crazy. I... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I preach the gospel of comic books and pop culture and movies. That's what yeah. we do. <laughs> we so, anyway. I know, I know Brian's uh, particular poisons. Robbie, what's your, what stuff are you into comics wise? <sighs> Everything. Yeah. Like my, my, my jam is fantastic Four. that's okay. like my number one thing. I'm a huge Grant Morrison fan. I love Grant's work. The book invisibles. Uh, which the matrix is loosely kind of based on a little bit oh, um, interesting. completely changed my life multiple times. It's, it's, it's my current scripture basically. Okay. Um, I, I've never read that. I got to read that. It's a, it's a bit esoteric, Yeah, <laughs> but it's, I, it's you know, really fun. I grant my first foray into reading Grant Morrison, I believe was uh, all-star Superman. And I didn't get it at the time. Now I'm like, oh, I see what they were doing. It's brilliant, you know. Um, but back then it was like, I, I just, it was kind of over my head. It was, it was too much, you know. Grant Morrison likes to, likes to throw everything at the wall approach, and yeah, <laughs> I wanted the Superman secret identity birthright, like more realistic kind of, like if Superman existed, it would be kind of like this, yeah, and not like you've been uh you know irradiated with one quintillion whatever of sunlight and you know uh so now that i'm a more matured comic book reader i need to go back and read more grant morrison i think i uh well, i think i felt kind of the same way when i first read that because i i grew up on the john byrne superman the movie superman and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff a little bit depowered a little you know he died and we watched superman die Right. And what I love about Morrison's All-Star Superman, which to me is, I think it's my favorite Superman comic book, but I mean, there's a lot of great ones. Um, but like that one to me encapsulates everything that makes the character this messianic sun god mythological yeah. figure. And I think that was the intent, right? Is that it's yeah. all canon. It's all, it all happened. It all matters, which I dig. Actually, you know what? Now that I think about it, I think it was the animated version of that story that made me go, Oh, that's what they were doing. Right. Because it didn't click when I read it. And then once I, once it was performed for me, I was like, ah, yeah. One of my favorite <laughs> moments too, is when Luther's like, when he finally is able to like see everything and he's like, I see everything now. And I'm like, I was wrong. Yeah. Like yeah. I could have done so yeah. much and like, yeah. Oh, it just, oh, it's just, it's such a, 
The one thing I hate about the animated movie is that they cut out the Bizarro stuff, but they kept yeah. in the damn uh, Hercules and Samson shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I was I, like, that yeah. probably wasn't a fair trade, was it? I don't think so, but, you know, whatever. But I, I love all Star Superman. So I love Grant Morrison. Fantastic Four is my jam. I'm big into indies. Um, anything from Vault Comics is one of yeah. my favorite comic yeah, books out they're, there. They're putting out cool stuff. They super, super, the, yeah. like, very much so. So, and and I'm big into Power Rangers. I'm an action figure guy as well. I love okay. stuff in the 80s and 90s in particular. Yeah. Um, but they 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 get me with some of these newer ones sometimes. Yeah. Uh, um, big Mo, Mo too, obviously. So, Doctor well, Doom is my um, favorite character of all time. I just oh, opened nice. up this classic Doctor Doom. Is that the one? Does that have the cloth or no? Because no. I think, oh, that would have been a Marvel Legends. I think. Well, it's got this it. one, the cloth right there. Oh, okay. This okay. is a new one that they did. It's Marvel Legends. Okay. Uh, and it came on a like a blister card. Just oh, like yeah, that's right, like the retro yeah. classic kind of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, those are cool. So really good. But my my favorite new kind, like my pick of the week this week was Homesick Pilots. I'm a big fan of Dan Waters. I gotta Rom read that. Dude. Yeah, that one looks really and cool. Casper's doing an amazing yeah. job with that, man. Yeah. What'd you say, Brian? Yeah. And I, I was gonna say, pretty much every Dan Waters book is pretty amazing. And that this one is like, yeah, it it's just super dope. Um, but I I did want to bring up that uh you both are Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fans too. So uh I, I was surprised you didn't bring that up, Robbie. I mean, I brought you a Batman. Oh yeah, my favorite turtle is Michelangelo. Who's yours, Ibrahim? Oh, I'm a Raphael guy. Of course, everybody. Yeah, is. I know. But <laughs> however, I I have started to come around though uh, to Leonardo because I've always I always like Leonardo. I liked all of them, but yeah, um, I I have always really enjoyed the 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 characters that everyone else thinks are boring, right? Like Superman, obviously, Leonardo, Cyclops is my favorite X Man. <laughs> like, so it's kind of fitting that I I, I like the leadership ones who are often in blue captain america you know <laughs> so nice. um you know my best friend and i uh got into a a joking kind of like debate because i told him I, I was quoting you guys ever watch workaholics when they had their ninja turtle episode and they were like dude i'm i'm Raphael. you're michelangelo and then at one point they're like no dude, you're not even a turtle you're that bitch danny like <laughs> <laughs> so i we were joking about that and um and my friend was telling me how Michelangelo is the best turtle because uh, something about how he he has the weapon that is the most chaotic and requires the most control. And like he had this really cool reasoning. And I was like, I mean, I always like Michelangelo, but. And the way yeah. that that's kind of put against this this guy who's like very loose and a partier and he loves pizza and like and he's the party dude. Yeah. You know, yeah, Michelangelo's a party dude. He's Michelangelo fits my personality. You know, that thing goes around every once in a while where it's like pick three fictional characters that that best define you, right? And it came around again in the PCP army. By the way, if you're not already, y'all join the PCP army, the official pop culture philosophers Facebook group. If you're not on Facebook, don't worry, we won't hold that against you. We understand. Um, but uh, I, I always choose Zach Morris, Brody from All Rats, and Michelangelo. That's that's me. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, those are all kind of along the same track, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You yeah, can kind of piece it. it together. I dig it. <laughs> Brian, what about you, man? Are you? I know you're not like the biggest turtles guy, right? But do you have a favorite? Well, I, when I was reading it, when it was, uh, you know, because like you mentioned before, I'm old. Um, so I, you know, I was there for the original uh, uh, black and white. That's issues. right. That's um, right. Um, I think I gave you some of them. <laughs> while back uh but uh i, I like Raphael because he had the sigh you know and and uh uh you know electra was a big deal then when those were coming so like yeah. I, you know it's kind of relating it to that but and he said damn in the movie right like when i was like 10 sure. years old i was like yeah <laughs> damn my parents made me sell it sell the video at a garage sale because of the profanity in it oh, man. which i would hear <laughs> multiple times a day from my father. So I was like, come on now. But uh, <laughs> did you, did you ever get the NECA uh, movie figures? No, I, uh, I stay away from that. Uh, new figures are really expensive and yeah. I have, I, I'm a big power Rangers guy and I'm trying to learn to stop 
yeah. with the Power Rangers, right? Well, because you're probably getting the the are you getting the Bandai ones or are you getting the the Well, I had I got the Bandai ones, I buy the Zords, I buy the the Lightning collection, all that shit, right? Yeah. And and then I recently got back into Transformers because those new ones, the Hasbro is is they're just freaking amazing. Yeah. Um and I this and within the last year I started really hardcore in a vintage Motu collection. I was say that that those gray skulls are you know with the point dread, I have the record and everything and the box. It's beautiful. But uh you know, working at a comic shop, you know, hobby shop like that, it's Oh, it's I, dangerous, right? It's dangerous, but yeah. at the same time, it's cool because when stuff comes in, I get the first, like somebody just traded in this massive spawn collection. And so like, I got a crate of spawn figures that I'm going to be getting. In fact, Sunday night, I'll be opening up a medieval spawn, everybody from wave one. So there you go. It's nice. <laughs> but yeah, big toy guy too. I, I like that you do customs, you know, um, if you ever got some free time, just let me know. I got some ideas. <laughs> oh man, I have, like, I'm such a fool with that stuff. I, I'll, I'll get an idea. Uh, like I've, I've toned it down, but for a while there, I was like, Oh, I should make this. Well, now I need to buy all the things to make that. And then I would get another idea. Then I buy all the shit for that. And before I know it, I'm like just swimming in action figures. And I'm like, I got to And you know, there used to be little shows where you could like, you know, pay 30 bucks for a table and then you just sell your figures. Yeah. What are those? Them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm hoping we get to do them again within the next year or so. Cause I got some shit to offload, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but man, those okay. naked turtles and they're, they're not exorbitant. I mean, you know, you can get them at Walmart in two packs. Now they're about 25 bucks a pop. So Bro, they look good. I, yeah, did you, did you incredible. get the, uh, did you get the out of their shells box set? Cause that's what I wanted. No, I, I, I'm a purist with turtles. I just want okay. like, ground level like or you know street level grounded movie version type I stuff gotcha. and that's why all i wanted as a kid too and the movie star turtles that came out were cool but these looking exactly like the the, yeah. the suits is like everything i ever wanted yeah. i've toy. seen them they're gorgeous in fact the neca ones that they're doing based on the old school playmates one are they're amazing like oh, they those look, are the um uh, or super, super seven, seven. Yeah. Super seven. those are freaking good man but yeah the neca ones are good <clears throat> they're doing there's a target exclusive box set of the retro movie figures. Yeah. And you're doing the splinter and the super shredder, which I have a super shredder, but I don't have any of the movie figures cause they're pretty pricey nowadays. Yeah. So I think I'm going to get that. I do have four of the original turtles in the turtle van and a shredder. Nice. Um, but I, the problem is the foot soldier is pretty expensive and I want like 20 of them. Yeah. To go I with had... my Uber expensive technodrome that I haven't bought yet. <laughs> yeah. When I, when I first was breaking into comics like uh, I was working on that book high crimes and at the same time I had gotten hired to to do some animation work so I was working like on staff on a on a uh, high crimes thank you Brian uh, I was working on staff on like a, a couple of cartoons that were on like FX and Fox um, doing doing what they call keyframes so basically like you have a storyboard and there's like a specific you know shot of like the characters here and then they're there and then they're here. Right. And so I would draw those redraw the character in those poses, like on model. And then the animators would link them together. Right. So there was like a, a small army of us doing that. And it was the first real money I was ever making doing art. And I was, I would do that for eight hours a day. And then I would do high crimes for like another eight hours after that. Cause we're trying to hit the deadline. And so like, I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't spending money on anything. So I was like, well, shit, let me, let me recapture some of these toys from when I was a kid. So I managed to get three of the four movie star turtles, like pretty mint on card. I since parted with two of them. Cause I really was like, you know, I'll just keep Raphael. I don't, I'll, I'll be fine without the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, but now of course they have that pack coming. And I also had back in the day, KB toy stores had like a re-release of, from playmates of like the movie star shredder and splinter and the splinter was the one that had the felt yeah i, had, I got the felt splinter yeah yeah so i i picked those up and then i got a foot soldier like a, a, with canadian packaging at one point and uh and i i eventually traded those in at a at a toy store a local place that does like you know credit and trade in and shit like that nice. um, but now that that target pack is out i'm like man it's of course it's selling out super quick but if yeah, i can if i can track one down i might have to get that the price is solid so yeah yeah it's really good because the they've done previous packs like that that were like 80 to 100 dollars, but this one's like 50 or 60 or something so yeah pretty worth it like pcp army 
if you really want me giving me a Christmas present, I won't use a PS1. But, well, unless you get me Need for Speed, Hot Pursuit, I will play the hell out of that game. All right. <laughs> we could talk forever now that we're into know, the realm right? of action figures. <laughs> Brian, any final thoughts or questions for your cuz? Well, uh, just, uh, I guess, uh, you want to throw out your uh, social links and, and uh, are you going to be opening up for commissions anytime soon or just any kind of things like that? Or uh, Yeah, I will. I Thank you. I definitely need to share that stuff. So again, uh, countcomic.com. You can watch the trailer. You can buy the book. Um, if you go to my website, IbrahimMustafa.com, um, you know, it's got links to my online store, my where you can get copies of Jaeger and High Crimes. Um, it's got links to my social media. I, I post art and action figures on there's Jaeger. Thank you, Robbie. Um, that's a that's a 48 page like prestige format story I did that I was uh, lucky enough to get nominated for an Eisner for. Um, and it's uh, it's like a, a Nazi sp or spy hunting Nazis story. So, uh, you know, if you like re revenge is kind of my thing, you know, if uh, if you like that kind of stuff, uh, you know, it's also kind of James Bondish espionage. It's dope. And the coloring, by the way, is awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, man. I was really looking at the, the Darwin Cook Parker books while I made that. Nice. So it's got, you know, my style. I, I changed it for that book because I wanted to do something a little bit more in the Alex Toth Darwin cook vein where it's a little more pared down and, and graphic. Um, so yeah, I've got those, uh, on my website. Um, and, uh, yeah, social media on Instagram, I post art and, uh, action figures that I've made, uh, Twitter. I try to share art, but it's a little more just like, you know, jokey bantery stuff. That's where I get to communicate with people a little bit more. Um, so if you ever have any questions about any of my stuff, you can always hit me up on there. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. I'm not going to be doing commissions for a bit because man, the, the, the promotion cycle for count has just been wild. Like I'm doing a thousand podcasts and like, uh, in email interviews. So chances are, if you follow any one website, you'll probably see something about the book on there <laughs> because the, nice. the PR team is really doing, earning their keep by keeping me busy. So, um, Oh, thank you, Travis. Yeah, Robbie, you need to invite me back, man. Well, I'll tell you what, this is the first <laughs> book of a three Station. book deal. I'm looking forward to at least two more. Station. <laughs> so hell yeah, absolutely. We got yeah, a lot of love for Darwin Cook. Yep. R.I.P. Yeah, no kidding. We lost. Oh, thank it. you, Jacques. i i I was about to apologize for rambling and going on tangents. This is what, this is what we love, man. This is cool. what we do. Cool, cool. <laughs> no, thank you guys again for having me on. Uh, you know, it's been a long time coming. Brian has been, you know, uh, extolling the virtues of of the show and your shop and everything. So I'm I'm so happy to finally get to chat with you in person. You know, yeah. He didn't go on too much about how I missed getting him that one cover that you did for James Bond Origin because that's all I ever hear from Brian. Yeah, I, well, I mean. I mean, you act like you don't, it's not a big deal to you, Robbie, but I mean, it's your one big failure, you know, at the store <laughs> is not being able to get me that variant cover. And I know it affects you. Which one? Which one was uh, it? I think it was number eight. It was in the origin. Cause like you did variant covers for all of them. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and I was getting all those and then like one, uh, yeah, I, that one just, I don't know. got, you know, do you remember what the packed in there? I'm trying to remember what, what image it was. Number eight. I, I didn't dig it up by now. Uh, was it was it the poker one where they're like fighting and there's poker cards flying everywhere? I think it was. Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah. I'll look and see if I have any. I'll I'll send it to you if I do. See, Ibrahim, Ibrahim can make up for my 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 mistake. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll, I'll take it. Whatever. All right. With apologies for Robbie. Ah. Here we go. <laughs> please, <laughs> please do. Please do. Yeah. We would love it. Ibrahim, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Brian, thank you, man. Thank you for being here. Everybody, you need to check out Count. And if you haven't already, go check out his website. Get Jaeger. It's Robbie approved. It's worth it. Get high crimes. Get savage things. Get everything he ever did. He, he did Mother Solstice. Panic, Gotham AD. So, James Bond Solstice is one of the best James Bond books I have ever read in comic book form. Um, and I've never read any of the novels. So I guess it's just one of the best James Bond books I've ever read. <laughs> thank um, you, man. I covered it in the weekly comic book review when it first released and I gave it high praise. So y'all check out his work. Count comes out March 16th in bookstores, 17th in comic shops from humanoids. It's awesome. 
And if you're local, come buy it from us and you may wind up getting an original drawing. And also I should mention, I'm going to be doing a, a giveaway of some kind through my social media as well uh, for some pretty cool art. So, um, you know, and that even if you win the giveaway through Robbie shop, you're still eligible. It's basically I'm just going to have people post a picture of them with the book and then you get entered. So nice. Um, and also uh, shout out to everybody who uh, was in the live chat with us tonight. Thank you for contributing. That was fun getting to chat with you all. Yes. PCP Army, we love you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are dipping out. Remember, go buy an Ibrahim Mustafa comic book. Watch a James.